Westmeath, although drawn first against uh, Dublin, won't be having a home game in next year's Leinster Championship. As things stand, you're shaking your head. Shane Williams at 8.50. Uh, Rich Tires Rugger coming your way at 9.15. And then Sports News with Phil around about 9.20. Um, so they should have a home game, you think? I think so. I was having one of my mates, Colin McCormick, said it's, it's the... Between Westmead and Dublin, we've we've won 15 out of the last 16 Leinster titles, so it's <laughs> going to be it's a fair enough uh, draw, I would have thought. Clash of the Titans. Yeah. Right, let's uh, bring you through the newspapers. I'm going to start with the Examiner this morning. Uh, Pluck of the Irish, that's the uh, Ireland women's national team after the third goal went in. Uh, so we went 2-0 up, got back 2 all from Ukraine after some bad defending and uh, bad goalkeeping error, and then 1-3-2, so... Um, Victory for Pau in her first game as manager in Donald and Simone physicality will weigh heavily on Schmidt's mind. I mean, it is true that we're going to end up getting a tournament ending injury for at least one and potentially two people in this game. Well, I don't know. People always think physicality is what brings injury, but the, the reality is when you know you have a physical game, like the, the, the thing, the, what really gets bad injuries is when you go, when you go, we don't go hard into your, into your collisions. So yeah. You've got to actually commit to the collisions because uh, that's kind of the same aspect of the Irish Daily Mail is the saying that like that, that we were talking about. That's what's missing and seems to be that level of, 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 it's not even anger. It's, 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 it's hard with rugby. It's, it's, I think, I've never, I've never, I remember playing against Simone myself and I took a, I was playing number eight at the time, don't ask me why I ended up number eight, but I took a ball off top of a line out and I'm in, in between the centres and there was a skip pass between me coming and I was like, I was coming as hard as I could go, like, and I wasn't the, like, at the time I, I was a big enough lad and I, I hit a Simone centre and I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I'm going to survive, I couldn't breathe for, couldn't, he hit me right there and I literally couldn't catch my breath and he didn't move an inch and I go, my God, they're bred like this. So the Irish lads know this. I would be very, very, very surprised that the Irish team play face play the way they played against uh, Russia. Yeah, was it, you've got to try and pass it on so that you... You're going to have to. And I think what it'll be, it might be even one out, one, two out and I think Conor Murray will have to keep them a bit more honest as, a, as I think the box kick to be fair, every Irish team, I know it's worked well for us, but it's, it's, it, it's not like teams don't prepare for it. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game plan that we have, but I do think we, we need to keep defences far more honest because, if I, as I said, if I was playing six or seven field day against that, it's... We're, we're not going to go out this weekend, are we? Oh, no. I, 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 I mean, if we do, like... like, <laughs> like like I can't even describe. If you, if you lose, Samoa are not a great team. No, they really aren't. They're not a great team. I mean, they sound like a better team than they might be. Uh, when I heard people here Samoa, they go, "Oh, they're definitely better than Russia. Not a million miles better than them." And um, you know, but they're definitely far more physical, and they'll definitely hurt you. So I, I would imagine Ireland will just. And at the end of the day, we need to, we need to, we, we need to just get through this game, get the bonus point. Yeah. And I do believe that that intensity is there. Yeah, okay. Back of the Daily Mail is a crazy call. This is Larry Tompkins. Uh, Larry Tompkins yesterday said the prospect of Cork not playing for the Sam Maguire next summer is crazy. The most championship draw pitted Cork against Kerry in the semi final, which, if they lose, could potentially see the Rebels drop into a second tier competition. Because <clears throat> obviously they got themselves into their own trouble by ending up in Division 3. Um, but certainly it's not the draw that I presume the GA president wanted because now people see that the Tier 2 competition will be as stark as that if Cork in Division 3 don't make the uh, Munster final, don't be Kerry, then lo and behold, they're no longer in the um, Sam Maguire. Supermax escalate money dispute with Goway board. So Supermax have doubled down on their statement last week by issuing another statement. Um, and um, they're saying they're seeking the transparency and accountability which are vital to confidence going forward. Supermax acknowledges that a lot of honourable people contribute at all levels of the GA, and whilst there are the beginnings of a necessary change in culture, the path forward cannot be laid until the issues of the past are revealed. So they're calling for uh, full disclosure of the Mazar's report and everything else that's happened, where the uh, money in Galway GA has gone. This is on the back of the last two candidates for the hurling job. Bear in mind, the hurling and football jobs are both open in Galway at the moment. Uh, Fernie Ford and Noel Larkin withdrew their names from the race. So, as it stands, there's not going to be a manager of the Galway Hurlers next year. Now, maybe Supermax are going to end up getting the old back. That, that the, that, like the Supermax story is a very interesting one on, on McDonough, on the, the governance stuff. I mean, 
straight away. It's the same thing with the FAI. If there's unsettlement anywhere, it's going to put coaches off going anywhere near it. Yeah. It's just, it's not, governance has it's become so critical yeah. in sport. So it's, it's obviously, it's a fair enough ask by uh, Pat McDonough. If you're Porrick Joyce or there's a couple of candidates for the football, um, you want the best opportunity because you're not going to get the opportunity to manage your county more than once, more than likely. So if now is not the time to be going in, if there's going to be mayhem behind the scenes for a couple of years, and why, also, why it, your time? It changes your life uh, in Gaelic. Like Gaelic is still, for me, I adore it, but it, you're, you're either incredibly uh, lauded or, or, or supported or you're actually, the, you can't go to your local spa for a coffee yeah. without getting abused. And if you, I wouldn't be taken on a squad if I felt there was unset, kind of an unsettling feeling in, in, in any capacity. Or if you weren't going to be able to afford the backroom team that yeah. all of your rivals have. Because you know what Mayo have, and you know what Oscarman have, and you know what Dublin have, and you know what Kerry and Cork have. And if you don't beat those teams, well then you're a chump. And we have to stop this argument that it doesn't make a huge difference if you don't, if you have that that, that ability. I haven't. I've been. You know, I've been around Gaelic teams. And um, if you don't have full resource, Gaelic at, at that level is incredibly hard. You're going to work at. at you know, we've heard these stories. You're going to work at seven in the morning, probably before after a gym session, working all day, home straight onto the pitch, then back to your kids or wife or husband, whatever, and then you're. This idea that if you have stuff laid out for you, you have your meals, you have all this, it makes life a hell of a lot easier because ultimately at elite level, that's the stuff that stresses you, yeah. is, is not having your prep and, and, and knowing that other people might have that prep. So I think that's to me, is, is if you don't have that as a Gaelic team at whatever level you're at, at this point, it's very, very hard to compete and that is an essential part of, of, of sport. Yeah, well when Tipperary were pointing out that they have a second bus for their uh, backroom team and they've won the All-Ireland and they're super professional and they're being lauded for it, then everybody else must be demanding something similar from their county board. And if you're going in and your reputation is going to be defined, your entire career is going to be defined by your success or failure as the manager of Galway. I was at a dinner in, in Mansion House for, uh, like, um, for the Tenio uh, thing and, and which was it was really actually quite positive though, right? Like we're gonna we we wanna win this, we're gonna make it everything work possible do possible to make it win, make every resource available. And that's what you gotta do. If like you look at Dublin have those resources, Tipperary now And they did I, it. They did it. Um, so I, it does make a difference and they were lucky enough to have somebody who was that passionate about the county. But uh, you know, the other at the end of the day there's still an amateur sport and we have to figure out a way and the argument being I absolutely don't believe, say for in the likes of Dublin, that Dublin should drop their standards. Dublin standards are the standards we need to find. Not everyone will get there or have that resource to get there. Um, I understand that, but the idea of telling teams to, to, to be to be worse yeah. is a silly thing to think about. Train I think less. Is, train less, don't get it any they're gonna take what they have. I just think it's up to the GA to figure out how do we how do we narrow and that's the look to the academies at the IRFU. That was a long-term game. That wasn't, you look at Westmead, where I'm from, is there long-term strategies there to develop the six, seven, eight-year-olds to by the time they come to John Heson's edge, they're, they're at that level. Um, that's at lead sport, it's all a long game. It's not a, let's make our team better next year. It, that's not how, it's not gonna happen. It's definitely not working at the minute. Right, the front page of the uh, Times this morning is Gordon Darcy's column. Right now, right here, Sexton simply must be on the pitch at all times. Um, I think Darcy's calling for him to uh, play the full game against, at least until the bonus point is secured. That's how we talk about these things now. <coughs> um, but I mean, the fact that he didn't play against Japan, the fact that he didn't play, the fact that Henshaw didn't play, the fact that so many players didn't play against Japan means that we could have a, quite a different team just simply because some players have not been in form by the time the quarterfinal rolls around, that you can actually get some confidence. The other thing you is can talk it, yourself into a bit of confidence and it's a different team now. I love, I, I do, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all these, like especially Darcy knows the stuff, he's been, in the, he's, been in the, he's been in the kind of middle of it. But I think nobody has the full context of the squad unless you're in the squad and you're around the squad and you know what's happening. You look at someone like Robbie, um, Robbie hasn't played a lot, uh, regardless of whether his hamstring is in good shape now. Um, even that quick hand-eye coordination stuff, that takes a few games to, to kind of build back up. Um, so I think with Johnny, um, I think at the end of the day, I think Carty's actually, when, he's, when he has played with a little less fear, he's been really good. Yeah. And then I even saw again in the Japanese game, he played with that first 20 minutes of fearlessness and it was actually glorious to watch it. And then something happened and that fearlessness went and maybe it was a leadership thing. I think with Johnny, what you're missing most on the pitches is leadership. Yeah. And leadership on a rugby pitch is crucial. Like Rory is obviously world class, but... Um, it's a different animal when you're running a backline. Yeah. Um, and you need to. You could, but the backline against Japan couldn't. You couldn't run it because, because the pack were being destroyed. 
Um, whereas against Scotland, it was good to watch. Even the phase play was good to watch because we were making ground. And we killed them. And we killed we, we In the first 20 minutes, yeah. it, was, it was over. So um, the phase play can work. It can work if, you're, if, you're, yeah. if, if your game plan's on point. And, and it, it worked against Scotland to a point. But there was, if you watched the Scotland game back, there was that kind of, they were, they were petrified to, 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 to kind of speed up the line speed because Ireland were threatening all the time. Um, and we just haven't done that since. But we've played two teams that we probably underestimate. Well, one team we definitely underestimate. Yeah, for sure. Okay, three minutes past eight this morning. You're listening to OTBAM. Uh, stick or twist, Mick? Georgia versus the Republic of Ireland, and it's a picture of James McLean. It's D-Day for Ireland as boss Mick McCarthy decides what to do with his injury hit squad. It's a Paula Harris story. Big decisions for bosses. Injuries mount had a crucial ties. McLean last night remained a concern, having trained away from the main group owing to a back complaint. Shane Duffy and Dave McGoldrick will inform the Ireland boss today if they're fit to play a part mm. in the games against Georgia and Switzerland. So they're not in the squad now, but they can be supplemented ahead of tomorrow's two o'clock flight to Tbilisi. So um, it's getting to that point where we'll know basically after these two games whether or not we're going to be um, at least getting a playoff. I'd say all, literally every, every kind of, every, like everyone wants Ireland to be in the Euros. I mean, and like, I'm talking more than being, where it's being hosted. Um, I was talking about this last week about the, the, the French and, and the difference the Irish fans made. I know this is a cliche at this point, but uh, with the Irish squad, I think Mick McCarthy is, I think he's trusted. You'd play for him. I'm actually even looking at the, the women's squad last night. This is another prime example of, so obviously with the FAI, the issues that are there, um, there'd, be a, there'd be an element of, of, of issues with, within it. Hopefully it fixes itself. But with, one thing I'm noticing with the Irish squad is even 5,500 people in Dallas last night. That, that's, that's a play that's been called over a period of time. They're, they're, they're looking at how do we build this game and it's starting to happen now. And we're starting to get these results and people are start, starting to really grab attention. But it was a strategy that was put in place to get to build, to build these kind of, to put five and a half thousand people. So I'm watching that these are things that we have to like, in terms of, to look, I was watching, watching it online, my mate had a, was, at, was at it last night and he said it was an incredible atmosphere. So these are, these are the positive things that are happening, um, and you have to kind of ask well, how they're happening. And we also have to be positive that the, the Irish squad are starting to get kind of some kind of relative kind of coherence together. Um, so there's positive thing happening on the pitch. And there's a bunch of kids coming through who are really good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know enough about how the youth development works, but Rude Doctor has been there long enough now. The regional development squad's been there long enough now. That you're thinking it can't be a coincidence that. Um, all of a sudden we have players from outside Dublin starting to make it, it yeah. across the water. Like Your issue once again, though, Jerry, is it, it, once again, Ireland is this really strange... You, look, you look at the UK in terms of uh, developing players, the one thing that we have is the, the GAA. It has a, such a pull on young people, and so and in a really positive way, uh, and so has rugby. And so, so there's a bit, much bigger kind of competition. Look, in my case, like I got to 16, 17 years of age, and I knew at that point, you have to make a choice now. You cannot keep playing all sport. Even though I loved all sport, and more, I wanted more than anything to play for my county. And there was one actually, in, in, when I, I, I went to rugby scholarship to UCD, and Westmead were in the All-Ireland semi-final, after winning the All-Ireland final the year before. And I got the call from like Luke Dempsey going, we, we want you to play. Right. And I was like, I, I will lose my scholarship. And I remember getting in front of my coach. I goes, I have to go. I like this is you have to understand. This is my county. This is where my family live. I have to go and play that game. And he was like, No, you lose your scholarship if you do it. You're not playing that game. And it was weeks and weeks of absolute torture trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And uh, didn't think it was going to be on TV. And of course, I said, You won't find out if I go down and play. So I went down to Leash, and I came on. And uh, it was I remember it was raining. It was big white gloves, and like you couldn't miss me. Um, so, but luckily I didn't lose my scholarship, but I remember thinking that, it, like, that was, no one else had that decision to make, that was on that my under shoulders. under 21? That was under 21, so that's me, yeah. Right, and, and, and so obviously the coach did find out at UCD and said... Yeah. We kind of didn't do, do again, anything, like, or, the best part then is because Dave, Dave Billings, God rest his soul, was, was the, the, the Gaelic scholarship guy there, so he was like, I'll give you a scholarship, <laughs> so it's like, grand, so, but it was, it was at that point, I do remember having such, so many sleepless nights trying to figure out what I want to do, because I loved all sport, so you have that with soccer and GA and rugby, and you have these young kids who are talented, good athletes, and they have that pull, and the pull is generally coming from their, where they're from. Yeah, well, Aaron, Aaron Connolly, obviously, um, Superstar hurler mm. as well, apparently a very good footballer mm. as well. Obviously, is now one of the brightest young talents in the Premier League. Um, so there was obviously always going to be a, a call on his services, and I, I think I mean obviously he's made the right 
call for him. Well, for me, it was more my dad had put five, through, five people through college, and he was like, listen, if you're getting your college fees paid, you're, or got your college, if you're taking a scholarship, you're not playing. Like, and it was, it came down to economics, and my dad was like, army officer, he was like, listen, it's tough to put kids through college. If you have an opportunity to have a scholarship here and you can you can fund yourself, yeah, you have to take. And that was the, the decision. And that's the issue, say, with GAA, that that will always become an economic call. Was it the right call for you, though, in retrospect? No. <laughs> was it no. not? No. No. I missed Gaelic every day right. when, I, when I gave up. I don't know why. It was actually it was Shane Lowry's dad was coaching the Westmead senior team when I, when I, um, the, 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 the year I had to stop. And like I love rugby. I adore rugby um, to a point. But I think when it became professional for me, my my real love of sport started to die because it became very clinical. Yeah, you have to do this, and this is the rules, and this is the book, and this is the lineup move you have to make. And for me, I always loved playing rugby in a way that, like, obviously you need some kind of structure in what you're doing and stuff. But I, I was like, it kind of feels like I'm not. I have to just follow a kind of a rule book all the time. And what I loved about Gaelic football, and I still love about Gaelic football, especially if you watch the All Ireland this year, it's 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 quite a simple game. You know, really, not, not in any way diluting it. It's a really simple game. I remember my, my, my coach saying to me, you've one job. That guy you're marking, you, got a, you, 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 that's your, you, you have a role. And my first game at Westmead, um, I was young, quite fit. I was kind of at the kind of level of professional sport anyway. And I was coming up against, it was actually David Brady, <coughs> Mayo. And it was, I was like, this guy's going to absolutely crucify me. And I remember the, the guy playing with me says, if you try to mark him, he'll destroy you. Just keep running. Just keep running, tired him out, because that's all I could do at that point. And to be fair, David Brady was, well, listen, I'll run with you all day, don't worry about it. So it was a rude awakening with me, but I do think, I, mi I miss it a lot. And I still, when I retired from, from Leinster, that day, that week, I got a call from Paddy O'Shea. And Paddy goes, listen, I heard you're retiring. Uh, do you want to come down and play with Westmead this year? I was like, why not? And I went down to the Westmead squad, and Tomás O'Shea was the coach as well. Tomás O'Flaherty. Tomás O'Flaherty, sorry. Yeah. And, um, I am um, first training session. I was like buzz. I was so buzzed for it because it was a great buzz in the squad, and I had a feeling the squad. And luckily that year they won Leinster, and I tore my hamstring first session, and I just knew I was like I need to stop. I need to give myself a year off. My body's in bits. And was it a bad tear or was it like a? I I I'd been tearing muscles consistently. I had a double hernia. Went into quad ruptured quad. It, and 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 anyone who's in a, a played elite sport, the worst type of injury is a rupture. Uh, and mostly you never come back from one. Um, a bone break, you can kind of get back. Well, in the back of your head, psychologically, you're always going, if I'm, is that going to go again? Because it is the worst pain I've ever experienced, and I've broken a lot of bones, was a uh, rupture in my quad, my hamstring. So that was the end of it. And I, I remember Leinster went on and won, 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 Westmead won Leinster that year, and I was kind of, I was really upset that I didn't win a Leinster medal. I won a Leinster under 21 medal, and it would have been lovely to win a senior medal, but. Did they push you too hard? Did, did you push yourself too hard? What I happened? pushed myself too hard. Right. I, I, I actually, I came straight from uh, fairly intent. I, it was all, all my injuries have, well, essentially my, my, my first rupture came from actually not being cared for. One thing I will say with the IRFU is they really care for their players now. They didn't have that together when I played. I came back from the Under-21s World Cup in Sydney. I played every minute of every game at that World Cup and I think I was one of the only players who did. So my body was already put together with super glue. I was in ribbons and I had three days off. Like, you need six weeks off at elite sport rugby, especially rugby. I had three days off, and on the Wednesday, I was playing Connacht for Leinster Senior Squad. I was offered a uh, Leinster contract the day I, I landed. So you had to take the contract I had to. job. But I, that's where my double hernia happened. I remember in the middle in of the game. pitch, just being past the ball and just feeling this unbelievable dull pain in my stomach and going, what was that? I've never, it felt like an appendicitis almost. And I just dropped the ball, and I, knew, I had something seriously wrong here. And I, I didn't want to say it, because I'd just been offered a professional contract. And I kept playing and then ultimately had to go for hernia operations, had the hernia operation, came back too quickly and ruptured my quad. And that was the end of my career. Uh, so it was, ba it was badly managed. 21 at that stage? 20? 22. 22. Uh, yeah, and th that was a bad management. And I have no resentment for it at all. You know, part of it was me not, not being, doing what a young person would do, going, I have to play through this. I, I want to show them what I'm worth. And the hardest part, I'll say, is about, like I was watching my heroes, like people like Leo Cullen, who still is the best player I've ever played with. Um, he, I don't think he gets the credit he deserves as a player. And Brian O'Driscoll and Darcy and Shane Oregon, all these guys I, I was like, obsessed with and looking up to. And I felt like a taxi man with no car. I just couldn't show them what I was capable of. Um, because I, I, the minute I came into the squad, I was injured. And I, and I do have a bit of 
the idea is I, I, that was my biggest regret. I never got to go, listen, I'm actually, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm decent I at this. I deserve to be here. I'm decent at this. Um, and I think anyone who didn't play schools rugby always had that slight chip on their shoulder anyway. Yeah. So that was a tough thing for me to do. Okay. So did those injuries rehab for a period of time and then you just decide, you, do you never get back from them? Never played? I never got I never sprinted again after I tore ruptured my squad mentally. I never psychologically was able to, to sprint. I remember being, ga- being even gassed at the side of the pitch because it was that bad. It was a hole in my quad. And at the time, I, I, I was, it was in Leinster training. My, the Leinster bagman, John, uh, who I absolutely adored, he, um, he had to carry me up the stairs in my apartment in Donnybrook. I couldn't walk, and it was in my gear. And for five days, I, I just sat, sat on my couch eating snack boxes, get my flat, I couldn't move. And I, the next day, I got a call from my physio, but then I got, I got no kind of call from any of the, the kind of team or the coaches, and I was like, is this what we are? You know, I mean, I'm a, I was in a very dark place at that point because I was like, Jesus, like this is, and that's what, something we need with, 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 with elite sport and injury. Injury can do awful things to athletes. It can because they're not, they're not, they're told how to do everything, get more skillful, get more powerful, but not how to deal with that stuff. Especially when it's the first time you've had to deal with it. Oh, at that at that level where I kind of went, this is the end, and uh, it did. It kept me out, and about six, seven weeks later, I attempted to come back from. Uh, up your quad, which was the most, it, because I had to, I forced myself. So and you I, hadn't I, had surgery, it was just rested. No, I, had, I, was, I was told I needed three months and I came back and then I, yeah, went again straight away. I, I was playing number eight for Leinster and picked up ball back of a scrum, saw the gap, went for it, bang, pop, um, and that was it. I knew, and that was the hardest part. Next preseason, I just knew in the back of my head, I am not at the races here. And that is, uh, that was a tough thing to do, but I don't blame anyone for that. You know, I definitely don't blame anyone for, and it's definitely been something that's been addressed and fixed in in the system. And I think anyone in the IRF will but tell you. But it's such you. a waste of the resource that they've put into you in the first place, not to treat you properly when you get you, because the idea is that you bring somebody in, give them a contract, and you want them to stay for ten years as opposed to. That's not sport. The sport, at the end of the day, like no matter what it is, the bottom line of any business is profit. The bottom line of sport is winning, 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 winning. But and they have a much better chance of winning if they look after you. Yeah, they do. And but I think at the point being is is at that time I don't think that was really thought about. I remember Matt Williams saying to me because I was quite a skinny lad at the time. I'm skinny now, but I, was, I, I put on the weight. But one of the sports scientist uh, uh, ideas was to tell me to eat a sliced pan every day. Right. To put on the weight, which I did, and I did put on weight. I'd say so, yeah. And maybe that's why it ruptured me. Slow down. Yeah, I didn't, I, I lost, because that, that was one thing I did. I was, I was I quite, I, I was getting a player quite quick, quite, quite athletic, but then I lost that when I started eating Pat the Baker every day. I'd so say I so, yeah. Literally sandwich after sandwich, and I'd sit there and I'd be crying eating it because oh I like, can't eat any more of this shite. But it was, yeah, it was, that was it. The scientist in uh, inverted commas. Yeah, well, I, well you, you know, there was a bit of science to it, all right? How long did you spend with Westmead then? About 20 minutes. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, was, I, was, I remember just walking off and I said to Moss, I said, listen, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I, think I'm, I think my body needs to stop for a while. And he was lovely, he was grand. He just said, listen, it's, it's, it's really, it's unfortunate. And I really would have loved, loved to have played a Leinster final. More than anything, even to come on for 10 minutes would have been a dream, but I didn't. What was Paulie like? Some presence, I'll tell you that for nothing. I never, I remember he, he'd fly in in his helicopter and he'd land and he'd walk up and he'd just start talking. And, you know, it, it, that's, people talk about presence, not knowing what it is. Uh, it, whoever's met Paddy realised that's what it is. Yeah, just have to listen to it. Even sometimes you're going, for God's sake, it's still, yeah, this guy has it. Um, and I can see why. And let, making Westmead win in Leinster is no mean feat. Um, and that was a good Leinster. We, we, we deserved to win that one. So it wasn't like we just fluked, really. Yeah. Fluked one or two of them. But so did, so did Dublin. Yeah, no, that's, so you had a bunch of different interesting coaches. So you have Matt Williams, who else? Declan Kidney, Pawdy. Pawdy, yeah, I mean, uh, if I have to break them all down as, as coaches, I mean, it's, it's um, and Luke Dempsey who was a really, really good coach, another guy with a great presence. Um, but like for me, Matt Williams was very professional. Gary Ella was then, was, yeah, he came into Leinster. I don't think he enjoyed it. Uh, I don't think he quite had the, the what's the best words, uh, the hold of the group. Yeah. And I think, to be fair to Matt, Matt had the hold of the group um, and he lost it. And I'm not sure why, but I think the senior players started to kind of see. He was, not that he, he sometimes Matt had a, an incredible ability to tell you what you wanted to hear. And sometimes you need to hear stuff that you don't want to hear. Um, and there was a bit of that. But then I have to say, um, something that's really important to me is that of everything I've ever played, as I mentioned, Neil Cullen, he was the, the ultimate leader. Um, 
it makes absolute sense to me that he is as good as coach as he is, um, and how he is the respect of the squad that like he has. What, what, so, on a day-to-day -day basis, what was it that impressed you so much at the time? It just, uh, Leo didn't care who you were or where you were. Like he just didn't. He didn't have that about him. He just had this incredible. There was a, there was a, there was a click in Leinster. It always was. Like you know, any of the players will tell you. Anyone who's in the squad, maybe some of the Gary Browns and players who played it when I was playing, and there was definitely that involved. And Leo went to Leicester, and the story when Leo came back from Leinster, Leicester, he was like, "We're not going to win anything unless we fix this. Unless we figure out how to have." The word culture is thrown around a lot, but unless we figure out how to do something, and Shane Jennings was the other player, they, they went away and went, this isn't happening. And we have the team to win it, but we don't have this, this type of, this culture change. And I think Leo was the guy who kind of really instilled that. Um, and playing with them was a different, he was a, like, he controlled, the, he dictated the game. So if he wanted to slow the game down, he was brilliant at that. You wouldn't see that stuff, but it was very, very clever stuff. I remember playing against them, um, he was Clinetli in the Celtic League or whatever, whatever it was called, and he, the ball was kicked off. And he, he just said to me, he just said me, he told me to run past the ball. That's all I remember him saying, just run past the ball. I was like, I can't, my job is to compete. Ran straight past the ball, and whatever happened, it landed in my hands. And I was like, this guy's like, like how did you know that was going to happen? And he had it all covered up, but it was just, he was just a great leader um, and, an, and a lovely lad, lovely man. Um, and if I was playing now, I'd play my arse off for him. I, you know, I put, I would, and that's what you want from a coach, I think. Yeah. You talked about the, um, Kidney was in charge of your under 21... 19. Under 19, uh, sorry. It was Kieran Fitzgerald was my under 21. Okay, so Kieran yeah. Fitzgerald, right. Yeah. The, that under 21 team um, finished third in the World Cup? Uh, no, fifth. Fifth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was, we actually were good. We were, re we were a really good squad. We should have beaten England. We nearly bet the All Blacks. Um, Gavin Hickey got sent off for punching an 140 kilo number eight. Um, I was telling him beforehand when he, when he punched him. He kind of looked to us, going, here, lads, back me up. We were like, <laughs> we were just whistling, walking the other way, singing The Great Escape, going, I'm out, lads. Because we, we, yeah, he, they were massive. But we, we, that was a prime example of maybe a squad that didn't have loads of stars, but played really well together. Um, that was a good New Zealand team. They had uh, a famous leader amongst their, their numbers, the Richie McCall's team. Richie McCall. Uh, he, he was player of the tournament, I think, that year. And, and the thing about Richie that really used to strike me, Richie wasn't a big guy. He didn't appear that big under under twenty ones. Like I used to look at him going, "Geez, you could you could take him on, like you yeah. could hit, him. but like you hit him, it just came over. Whatever it is about him, and he became quite a bit. He was never massive. He was never like at that level. But I think he was a prime example of 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 rugby not necessarily being about it's about being incredibly athletic and powerful and aggression and, and aggression. And his if you watch Richie play, it's two things that I was most it's it's his it's his uh, it's angles. It's, he's all about angles and how he comes in on the ball. And he plays. To be fair, Richie played fifty percent of his uh, of his professional uh, career, um, bordering on utterly illegal. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, and he, 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 he knew how to play it, and the way he played the referee. But um, yeah, he was incredible. Aaron Major, the other half, he was playing. He was the big, the big, the big cheese then. Yeah. And a couple of incredible players, but we 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 should have. You know, we beat Argentina quite well. We beat South Africa forty three forty two. Right. Uh, which was uh, one of the best games in sport, I think it was 42-41. And at the point, I remember having, in that game, I had mask and, ta mask and tape at this point, and, and each elbow and each shoulder, I couldn't, sh I couldn't bend my arms because we were that, I was that bet at the right. end of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was in the middle of the game, they were, they were literally taping you up, up saying, because they were like, you were the, I was the main line-out option, they couldn't take me off. Right.